Alaska Multimedia and Sound Crew. Appreciate you for all you're doing this morning. And we are going this morning to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. I had three sermons I was going to try to do this morning, and I'm only going to do two of them. So, Second Chronicles, going to chapter 20. Second Chronicles, chapter 20. And uh, we're going to read uh, for our verse this morning, verse 12. Second Chronicles, chapter 20. You can look on the screens or, or turn your Bibles to verse 12. And the word of the Lord reads this morning. O oh God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Well, as we look around the world today, I, I don't know, have any of you been turning on the news and wanting to turn it right back off? Uh, it, uh, it's discouraging. It is discouraging times in our nation, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent or whatever you are, uh, it's discouraging. Uh, sometimes it's, it's discouraging as we think about the struggle in our denomination, as we, we think about the uh, things that are going on in the world. Uh, uh, there, there's just, uh, the, the world is, is uh, going crazy, it seems like. Um, was listening to uh, Dr. Richard Ladd, uh, he's the president of Southern Evangelical Seminary. Um, and uh, he was uh, meeting with a group of friends who he called seasoned Christians. Uh, he defined that as those in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. And uh, they were having lunch together. And they were talking about times in our nation when we've seen uh, struggles before. They, they were talking about uh, when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated and when Robert Kennedy was assassinated and how tense things were then. And uh, Amongst them, uh, in their opinion, they th said, I think things are worse today than they were back then with the tensions and the hatred and it just seems like a crazy place to be and and uh, I, I look at our United Methodist Church and it almost feels the same way in the church and that should not be folks e even if we disagree with other people we should still respond in love e even if we have disagreements over the authority of scripture uh, I I'm thankful for this church that, that we believe that God's word is God's word and we, we stand by it, and we're going to continue to stand by it no matter what the denomination does. And, uh, so, but still, it's discouraging sometimes to see that struggle. And, and we look at the world, and we see all the things happening in the world. Uh, China, I don't know if you know this or not, um, uh, kind of in response to uh, the pressure Trump's been putting on them, they're starting to persecute Christians more. Uh, they're, they're putting more uh, restrictions on house churches. They're telling them, all right, they have to sing uh, two communist hymns. I didn't know communists had hymns. But they have to sing two communist hymns before uh, every church service, and uh, the pictures of two of their high leaders have to be up on either side of the cross. It's, uh, uh, you know, that may not sound too bad to us, but my friends, it's, they're, they are, are, are bringing the hammer down on the church in China. Pray for our brothers and sisters in China. So as, as we look at all of this, these crazy things happening, the question is, what do we do? How are we to respond? Are we to respond how Congress responds to conflict? Hope not. Are we to respond as President Trump responds to, to difficult times? Well, probably not that either is the best example. Um, should we respond to how some of our Methodist brothers and sisters are responding? I don't even think that's a good idea. How should we respond? We should look to God's Word. We should look to God's Word and, and to our Heavenly Father to how should we respond to these times when we just don't know what to do? When we, how do we respond to crisis in our lives? Well, I think uh, King Jehoshaphat is a great example. He's a great example of, of uh, uh, who, how we should respond to, uh, uh, to crises. And as we look at Jehoshaphat, he was a good king. That's wonderful news when we read about the kings of Israel and Judah, because we don't hear that a whole lot. Um, and so, but Jehoshaphat 
was a great king. So let's look in, in uh, uh, chapter 17. I'm going to turn back just a couple chapters and see, well, well how does uh, the, the book uh, tell us about him? Uh, as we read verses 3 through 6, it says, The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the ways of his father David before him. He did not consult the Baals, but sought the God of his father and followed his commands rather than the uh, practices of Israel. The Lord established the kingdom under his control, and all Judah brought gifts to Jehoshaphat so that he had great wealth and honor. His heart was devoted to the ways of the Lord. Furthermore, he removed the high places and the Asherah poles from Judah. And now that's a big deal. Why? Because most of the kings that were good kings in Judah and Israel, they left the high places alone. I don't know if it wasn't politically correct. I don't know if it, they just thought it was too much effort or if they just thought, well, as long as we have good temple worship, well, then our people will ignore those high places. I, I don't know what the reasoning was, but Jehoshaphat, it says he followed the Lord with all of his heart and he uh, uh, sent out uh, his army, and they went, and they destroyed all the high places. They took them down so that it, to try to turn Israel's heart back to God. Uh, uh, later in uh, chapter 17, it talks about he appointed judges. And what were the judges there to do? The judges were there uh, to help, uh, well, obviously to judge, but his commission to them is to do things according to the Word of God and to help turn the people's hearts to God. He, he did everything he could. He did it from, from uh, Jerusalem. He did it out in uh, the, the towns and the cities. And he, did, uh, he just did everything he could to help people uh, find Christ. And I, I, or not, excuse me, not Christ, but find the Lord. And how wonderful is that? He, he, he was a good king. Uh, now, was Jehoshaphat perfect? No. He messes up a little bit later. He, he uh, makes an alliance with Ahab. You all know about Ahab, right? That's Jezebel's husband, in case you forgot. Uh, so... Uh, not a good fella, and, and Jehoshaphat really shouldn't have, have been making alliances with him, and he gets into a little bit of trouble uh, after uh, he does that, Well, because uh, he and Ahab go to battle against Ben-Hadad of, of the uh, Aramean, 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 good grief, easy for me to say, but in any case, they uh, go, and, and Ahab gets killed, Jehoshaphat gets injured, it, it's just not a great, a great day, and, and it's after this that uh, um, we see uh, our scripture for the day. And what happens? Well, as we uh, begin to look in Second Chronicles uh, chapter 20, we see that there is crisis with Jehoshaphat's uh, Israel, with his, his nation of Judah. Chapter 2, or excuse me, Second uh, Corinthians chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, says, After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, with some of the Minuites, came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea, and it's already at Hezion Tamar, that is, in Gedi. That doesn't sound good, does it? Not one army, not two armies, there's three armies coming. And as you can see, I got to do a map this week. I was really happy. And so that's why we did this sermon and not another one, because we got to choose a map. And so you can see, well, well where, who's coming after Judah? Well, you see the Ammonites there at the top, the Moabites there in the middle, and the Edomites. I know uh, in verse uh, 1 it, it said the, the Minunites. Well, that's actually um, a town that's in Edom. And later it talks about the people from Seir. Well, Mount Seir is in, in Edom. And so, uh, uh, so it's the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the, the Edomites, all three of them coming against Judah all at once. And it says they're already at En Gedi. Well, you see where En Gedi is? It's in the heart of Judah. So they have already gone past uh, the, their southern defenses. They are on their way to Jerusalem, not too far of a march from Jerusalem. This is crisis. This is a bad deal. If, if you can imagine the Russians being at Richmond, Virginia, heading towards D.C., that's not a good, good thing. And, and, and here, this is a bad situation and so how does Jehoshaphat respond? How does Jehoshaphat respond? See, uh, if I was Jehoshaphat, I'd be on the phone with the Pentagon. All right, we got to get everything we have over here ASAP. 
We, we would be uh, um, calling, uh, everybody has a gun, get, out, uh, uh, get it out, polish it up, get your ammunition, head out, and we're going to try to stop these folks. Of course, they didn't have guns back in Judah uh, in these days. But what does Jehoshaphat do? Well, let's, uh, you can look at the screens or continue on here. In verse 3, what does it say? Alarm, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. He resolved to inquire of the Lord. His first call wasn't to his military generals. His first call wasn't to his advisors. His first thing was to inquire of the Lord. I think that is fabulous. All right. What else? This is a, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. Now, wait a second. He proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. I'm going kind of slow through this. I'm sorry, Jerry. Uh, if you want to go fight a fight, do you think that being weak from not eating is a good idea? <laughs> no. You, you, you know, you don't want to pig out, but you want to be thoroughly nourished so that you are ready, so that your muscles have all the energy they need to go into battle. The king calls for a fast. Why is that? I think Jehoshaphat has the knowledge that they aren't going to get through this by their strength. Um, we'll, we'll continue on with that thought a little bit later. All right. So uh, let, let's continue on then. Where are we? We're I lost my place here. All right. Here we are. Here we are. So uh, he, they call the fast for all of Judah. Then it says, The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard and said, The Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? I like it that he calls Abraham God's friend. I think that's neat. Continuing on. They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword or of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they're repaying us by coming to drive, out, drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah with their wives, their children... And their little ones stood there before the Lord. What a picture. I mean, I just, I just love this image of uh, the whole family, even the little ones. Emmeline would be there. Now, she'd be interrupting Je uh, Jehoshaphat. But, uh, but you know, even the littlest ones were there. As they're standing before the Lord, they are praying, they are fasting. They are all focused together as a nation. And my friends, I think that's often what we need to do. You know, we have to realize it's not our strength. I think here in America, and uh, not, not just as a country, but as individuals, so much of the time we feel like we can do it on our own. You, know, uh, you even hear little kids, I do it. And sometimes I think God looks at us and hears us saying the same thing. No, God, I do it myself. And God's like, good luck with that. We can't do it on our own. We must depend upon the strength of the Lord. As we look here at Jehoshaphat's prayer, face of crisis, what does Jehoshaphat do? What does it do? He worships God, and he humbly acknowledges the nation's dependence upon him. And Jehoshaphat, what? He lays out that the nation has no chance against the advancing army. The leaders do not know what to do. They don't know what to do. But what does he do? In faith, 
he declares that despite the desperate situation, they are looking and trusting God to show them the answer. That's where his faith and his trust is. And uh, now, uh, one of the things that Jehoshaphat uh, uh, mentions in there is uh, uh, 1 Chronicles 7 14. Uh, what is that? That's God talking uh, to Solomon after uh, uh, he, Solomon has dedicated the temple where they are standing right there. And he, he's referring, making reference to that. Well, what is 1 Chronicles 7 14? What does that say? Well, uh, you can uh, flip over there or look at the screens. It says, If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. And remember the context. This is God talking to Solomon as they've dedicated the temple of the, of the Jews there in Jerusalem. But my friends, I think the principles are still true today. If my people, it's, uh, if we're waiting for the heathens to start praying to God for there to be revival, we're, we are mistaken. It's not going to happen if we're waiting for uh, all of the politicians in Washington, D.C. to have a prayer meeting together. My friends, it has to start with us. If my people who are called by my name. And what do we need to do? We need to humble ourselves, not be all judgmental. Not be all holier than thou, but we've got to humble ourselves. What does it mean to be humble? I don't believe being humble means to be self-debasing. That's not what it means to be, be humble. What it means to be humble is to realize a true understanding of who God is and who I am in relation to Him. Because there's no room for pride when we go, Oh, hi, God. Um, <laughs> you are God and I am not. And I can't even breathe without you. I can't even have a heartbeat unless you will it. That's my definition of being humble, is understanding who he is and who we are in relationship. And so we have to humble ourselves and pray. And we have to turn from our wicked ways. Now, now who's he talking about? He's talking about us. My friends, we in the church, we have to turn from our wicked ways. And we have to seek his face. There's so much to seek whether it's money or power, prestige, uh, vacation, good big homes, whatever it is, there's so much for us to seek. But what we need to seek is we need to seek Him. So we've got to, got to humble ourselves and pray and turn from our wicked ways and seek His face. And what does it say? It says, then He will hear from heaven, He'll forgive our sins, and I'll heal our land. My friends, Jehoshaphat is right on the money. It has to start with us. It's got to start with the people of God. If we want there to be change in, in the crises in our nation, if we want there to be change in the crises in our church, if we want there to be change in the crises in our house, in our lives, my friends, we've got to pray. We've got to pray and seek the Lord. It's got to be Him helping us. Now, we have to do our part. When the Lord tells us to do something, we've got to do it. We have to do our part. We have to be obedient. But remember whose strength we can rely on. It's not our strength. It's going to be His. So the people come and they do this. And Je uh, Jehoshaphat prays this amazing prayer. Uh, he, he references uh, uh, the past and, and the promises that God had made to Solomon right there at the temple. Um, and that's not the end of the story. They didn't just sit around waiting for an answer. Now, they did wait for a little bit. But then what happens? What happens is God shows up. Let's start in, in verse 14. Start in verse 14. And the word of the Lord reads, then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael. There's a quiz later, so you all have to know, know all those. Uh, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite, a descendant of Asaph. As he stood in the assembly, he said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged 
because of this vast army. Have you ever heard that before in Scripture? Do not be afraid. God says that a lot. You know what? I think it's, it's true. I think we should pay attention. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz. If Heather and I have a boy, I might name him Ziz. That's a pretty neat name. And uh, 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 if, you know, we're not pregnant, just to dispel any rumors or anything, just let you know. But uh, that, that's a good name for a boy. What do you think, Riley? That'd be good. No, okay, shaking her head. Uh oh. All right, in any case, too more early in the morning for jokes. But in any case, uh, um, they will be passing by uh, the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jer- Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Whew, like to hear that. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Uh, give you, uh, you, Judah, and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Woo! That's exciting stuff. Jehoshaphat that thought it was exciting too. What did he say? He said, Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshiped before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and uh, the Korahites stood up and they praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. What does that mean? The praise team came in. They got out the guitars and the banjos. Oh, well, maybe not. But they came out and they started to praise the Lord. They had a worship service. Again, is that normally how you prepare for battle? <laughs> it is when you realize who is in charge. All right. Verse 20, early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. And as they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army. Did you catch that? At the head of the army. Isn't that where the Marines go? Isn't that where you have your toughest armor, your strongest uh, defensive and, and offensive weapons are at the head of the army? But what did they do, Charlie? They stuck the praise band. Now, I don't know about you. I, I haven't seen the army put the army band in front as they've been going out in the battle. I've never seen that. Or the Marine Band, now they got some good players. They got some good music, but I've never seen them in front. But here, they send out the praise band at the head of the army. And what were they singing? They were saying, give thanks to the Lord, for His love endures forever. And as they began to sing and praise, did you catch that? As they began. As they began to believe in faith, God's power is unleashed. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and the Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished uh, 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 slaughtering the men from Seir, they uh, uh, heaped, dis- uh, excuse me, they helped to destroy one another. They, they turned on one another. You know what? It seems to me that uh, evil likes to turn on itself a lot. Now, sometimes they do get focused on God. Sometimes they get fo- focused on holiness. But every now and then, uh, when, when they get out of focus, they start biting each other. And that's exactly what happens here. God turned them upon themselves and helped to destroy one another. All right. Continuing on. Verse 24 says, When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off the plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder, it took them three days to collect it. 
On the fourth day, they assembled in the Valley of Barakah, where they praised the Lord. That's why it's called the Valley of Barakah to this day. Then led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lyres and trumpets. And the fear of God came on all the surrounding kingdoms when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel, and the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. It, can we get a woohoo? Man, that's amazing. That is so incredible. Can you imagine the whole army here? Uh, just 24 hours before, all they can see is doom and destruction. All they can see is no hope. But when they put their faith and their trust in the Lord, when they trusted God, He was able to take out all of the mighty armies that were coming against them. My friends, I don't know what armies you have coming against you, but my guarantee is that God is bigger. God is bigger than any of the armies that you are facing. My friends, as, as we are facing crisis here at home, as we're facing crisis in, in our, our, our church, our denominations, we're facing crisis in our, our nation, my friends, God is bigger. He is bigger than whatever giants may be in our lives. We do not have to be afraid. We don't have to fear. God is bigger than cancer. God is bigger than heart disease. God is bigger than divorce. God is bigger than children that are going astray. God is bigger than the sin that you're struggling with. Our God is bigger. The battle belongs to the Lord. Now, my friends, Jehoshaphat had to be obedient if the army had stayed in Jerusalem, this wouldn't happen. Why? Because God said, march out. And I guarantee you, if they hadn't have, have, have marched out, God wouldn't have answered. But the Lord did answer. The Lord did answer. And He answered in power and might. My friends, as we are obedient, as we are obedient, God will answer. Put our faith and our trust in Him. And remember that the battle is not yours, but the battle belongs to the Lord. This morning, are you facing a battle? Do you need the Lord to come alongside you to fight for you? My friends, either at your seat or at, at the communion rail this morning, if you need to just cry out to the Lord. I guarantee you, He's going to heal you. Now, I can't guarantee what it looks like. I can't guarantee what the answer is going to be. But I know He will fight for you. Remember, the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you today. Lord, we need you. We need you, Lord Jesus. You know the mountains that we're fighting. You know the fears that, that ensnare us and, and that consume us. And Father, we ask forgiveness, Lord, because we haven't trusted you with them. But this morning, we lay them at your feet. We lay them at the foot of the cross. We say, Jesus, help us. And not only help our situation, help us to believe. Help us to have faith like Jehoshaphat and to trust in you. Lord, and our prayer is that as we cry out to you in faith and trust, that you will hear from heaven and that you will answer. And Lord, we do pray together corporately here for our nation that you would send your revival. We are in desperate need of you, Lord. Help us to be the men and women of God you call us to be, that we can be your hands and feet, Lord. And if you want to start revival right here with us, so be it, Lord. <laughs> we give you permission to interrupt our lives. We give you permission to interrupt our schedules to accomplish whatever kingdom business you want us to for you, Father. Because it's not about what we have thought about in our lives. It's not about our plans. It's about your kingdom and furthering your kingdom. 
So come, Lord Jesus. Do your will in your way in your time. And it's in the mighty name of the Lord who is greater than the armies. We pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our closing song.